and today we have a really uh, special guest, and we actually met through uh, one of our advisors at Oakland Digital. His name is Wayne Sutton, who uh, I believe was in Forbes as one of the top 25 um, African American technologists, and he brought us to a place called Twitter, and we happened to meet um, not only the first African American engineer at Twitter, uh, we also met our guest today. His name is Justin Washington. Uh, he started off at Microsoft uh, as an intern, which is pretty cool. Doing things he probably didn't want to do, but he did that. Then he actually went to a company called Yahoo, which is an IPO company. Uh, and then he went to a company called Apple and worked there for a little under four years. Uh, iOS software QA engineer, QA quality assurance. He'll tell you what engineers do. And then he landed at where we met, at Twitter. Uh, and this was, I think, a m two months ago. And um, it wasn't necessarily even Twitter that really connected us. It was his love for music, our similar friends, um, and also his, his love for diversity and technology, which I think is a big deal. Um, and so we really meshed on different levels. So uh, let's welcome Justin Washington from Twitter. Thank you, Sean. Yeah, How y'all doing? Welcome. What's up? What's up? How y'all doing? All right, listen, I know it's early. Like, can we get a little little energy, okay? Can we? Can y'all talk back to me, okay? Yeah. Okay, cool. Can I hear y'all say, let's go? Let's yeah. go. Let's go. Say, let's go. Let's go. Say, let's get it. Let's get it. All right, cool, cool. We here, we here. Strapping young lad here. Man, look at my jacket, man. I, I, what is this going? It's like a 3X, and I was, you know, five and like three foot, whatever. Uh, no, this is me. Uh, I'm from Detroit. Originally, uh, it's interesting pictures. I was at my aunt's KSI. wedding. Cast, Cast Tech. Okay, mm -hmm. I went to Renaissance. Uh, <laughs> the bet. That's the better high school in Detroit. The best high school. She went to the. Best. Did one of my mentors did. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Cool, cool, awesome. Uh, from Detroit, Michigan. Um, I started off. Well, let me back up. Let me back up one second. I'll give you all a little. Um, uh, uh, an, an agenda for today. Um, this is not a, a really technical uh, talk. This is purely conversational. I'm going to give you um, my background and what I've done uh, in tech uh, and where I'm from and how I've kind of moved around and shifted and networked and made my way in my tech career and what I've learned. Um, and with design, you guys are graphic design students, uh, talk a little bit about uh, design and what I've seen in the real world as far as um, like mobile devices that have that are concerned and then um, I'll talk about just problems I've had to overcome and how as an engineer how I've had to interact with designers on the job uh, different problems I've seen and then uh, how it relates to you guys how code is important in design and how that's a skill that you may want to develop and get into make you more marketable and um, open it up for questions and we can just wrap and you can talk to me you can have conversation really informal super informal um, I'm your peer I'm not your uh, professor so uh, we can uh, make this super super friendly all right so back to this uh, handsome guy uh, so uh, from Detroit originally born and raised in Detroit City um, I don't know what you guys see in the news about Detroit a lot um, it's actually a lot like Oakland um, I um, uh, got into technology uh, or tech, I think around middle school. Uh, we had people come in, you know, for career day and they're like, hey, you know, what do you want to be? What do you want to do? And I picked up from, I guess, friends and parents that engineers and architects made a lot of money. So that's what just, I was just like, yeah, I'm going to be an engineer. I'm going to be an architect. You know, we make. X amount of money, X amount of dollars a year. So that's what I'm gonna do. Had no context into you know the nitty gritty of what they really do. I was just kind of focused on that. Uh, and then in high school, um, you know, I was good at math and science. I was getting good grades, um, and um, I knew the University of Michigan had a great uh, engineering program. So in high school, I just kind of settled into thinking like, hey, I like video games. I like uh, I like computers, I like computer games, I like technology, I like mobile technology. I think it's the future. I think I'll have a career and a job there when I graduate. Why not do engineering? So did that or kind of settled that in my mind. 
And uh, this is where I ended up. This is the big house, uh, Michigan. Man, I miss it just looking at that, man. That's crazy. Look at that. That's crazy. So crazy. Uh, man, so this is um, University of Michigan. Uh, I, I came here 2007, graduated in 2010. Um, man, the, the football uh, atmosphere at the University of Michigan is just super crazy live. I mean, the history there, I don't know how much you guys know. Um, but uh, is the culture there is just infectious, um, and uh, it's awesome. It's awesome. I think at the University of Michigan, I got the best of both worlds in um, going to a school where sports and extracurriculars were valued just as highly and respected as the academic prowess and you know the prestige of academic excellence. So um, that was cool. I had a great uh, four years at Michigan. Uh, so my freshman year came in, majored in computer science, engineering, uh, didn't know, had no clue what I was getting myself into. Uh, freshman year was, was such a grind because I was coming in with kids that were uh, coding and had been, you know, doing that stuff since they were five and six and seven years old. So it was just like, all right, like, what do I do? You know, I'm just a black kid from Detroit. Like, I like computers halfway, I think, I don't know. Uh, and they're just whizzing through it. So there was automatically that, um, that displacement of skill and you know, history that I had to grind through and muscle through. Um, but thankfully, at the end of freshman year, um, y'all know who this guy is, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, that's my homie, uh, Bill Gates. Uh, the summer after freshman year, I got an internship with Microsoft. Uh, so, you know, you just think, like, me, you know, not having any development experience, not having, you know, the slightest clue of what I'm getting into, uh, you know, my freshman year in college, and right off the bat, I'm working for one of the biggest, best software companies in the world. Um, and that's, that's a product of what I attribute it to God's grace and, you know, just networking and meeting people at the right place at the right time. Uh, but uh, that freshman year, that summer, um, I interned at Microsoft and I was on the exchange team. So the, um, the email uh, and server, you guys know about Outlook? Mm -hmm. Outlook, yeah, yeah. So, um, so that team. And um, I did a program called the Explorer Program and it basically allowed freshmen and sophomores to cycle through uh, the three different technical positions that they have, program manager, uh, software developer and test, and software developer engineer. Uh, so we got to get a taste of uh, all the positions that they offered. And um, you guys remember Windows Vista? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, yeah, so uh, yeah, a little ancient times. Uh, and they had like a sidebar uh, on the desktop where they had gadgets and little widgets you could put there. Uh, so my team developed a, um, a little gadget that went on the desktop that tracked bugs that were assigned to different team members on that team. Uh, so. Um, when I was in school, I was learning C++ programming language, uh, and then I got here, and I wasn't using C++ at all. We, that's my first, it was my first introduction to web programming, HTML, uh, JavaScript. Uh, and it's funny because, you know, I was just talking to Sean about um, being thrown in the fire, you know, and I was here, and I got this big internship, and I'm super excited, and I'm thinking like, yeah, I'm about to learn everything I, I learned in school, put it together, and they're like, no, you're going to do this. Uh, so it was back at square one, you know, working with people that have been doing this for years and, you know, I'm just like, oh, what do I do? Um, but that kind of process has refined me um, and just stripped away fear. I mean, I still get nervous, you know, in, in a lot of different um, aspects, but, uh, you know, you just getting thrown in the fire is, is such a great thing because, you know, you just come out and you're, you're so much better and, you know, everything you've, you thought you were, you know, just kind of thrown out the door and um, you learn, it forces you to, to strip away pride and to get into a place where you're like, okay, you know, I'm a student and I'm always a student. Um, no matter if I'm in the classroom or outside the classroom, I'm working for this company or that company, I'm always a student. Um, so that, that summer was awesome. I actually got to meet Bill Gates at his house, which was crazy. It was the last thing, it was the last summer they were doing that for interns. We had a big barbecue at his house uh, and I'm telling you, like Bill Gates' house is like, 10 blocks long, like, I mean, it's just like nuts. You walk in rooms and they adjust the temperature to your body temperature, like it was just, it was crazy, it was crazy. Uh, but it was a good time, great summer, great summer. So, sophomore year, uh, you guys know who 
Miss Slade is? No? Marissa Meyer? Yep, Marissa Meyer. Uh, she's the CEO of Yahoo. Um, like Sean mentioned, after my sophomore year, I interned at Yahoo. Um, she wasn't the CEO then. Um, okay. She wasn't the CEO then. Uh, it was a guy named Jerry Yang. Uh, you guys see that? Okay. Still? Oh, yeah, right. right. Forgot about that, yeah. Cool, technology. Uh, yeah, so um, she wasn't the CEO then, but I interned at Yahoo uh, my sophomore year. I was working on the Yahoo Messenger client. You guys ever use that uh, instant messenger client? Yeah, so I was doing that. Um, so once again, I'm doing, I'm learning one language in, in school for CS, but uh, I came here and I'm working in C Sharp. Uh, I'm working in a XML. Uh, language called XSL, Transform, uh, some web kind of native kind of stuff. Uh, and um, I know I'm being recorded, so I don't want to say the wrong thing. Uh, but um, once again, just thrown in the fire, like doing things that I wasn't doing before. Uh, so I'm at square one, I think, and I'm thinking like, man, like, yeah, I can't transfer anything I've learned. But it's funny because at Microsoft, I got that HTML experience and I was able to take that, what I learned from there, and use it here. Um, and that sophomore year, I, I kind of skipped ahead. It was my worst year in college. Like, I mean, I was on academic probation. Um, after my internship at Microsoft, I mean, obviously you think like you're on top of the world and you're like, my future is written, like I'm good, my ticket is here, like I'm, I'm on my way, you know. And I interview again, they didn't hire me back. So I was crushed, like I was, I was crushed. Uh, and that sophomore year, it was I was taking all the hard classes. Um, it was just, it was, it was horrible. Um, and the end of the year, I topped it all off. Uh, my girlfriend cheated on me, so I was just like, it was right before finals, so it was just like, world was just going down. I was, I planned on that summer, just going to Best Buy and working at Geek Squad, like you know. So you go from Microsoft and then you go into retail and Best Buy. It's like people are like, what happened? Um, but thankfully, thankfully, like I, I, I met a guy that was, um, uh, he was doing what I'm doing right now with, with you guys. And um, I'm like, man, it's the end of the year. I know internships are filled. I did this, I did that, I know this. Can you help me out? And they helped me out. Um, so I got that internship. I was in Sunnyvale, my first internship out here in California. Um, it was an awesome experience, awesome experience. Am I talking too fast for you guys? Are you good? Okay, cool, cool, cool. See, I know this guy, right? This, yeah, this is uh, my uncle, my uncle Steve. Uh, mm -hmm. Rest in peace, this is my man's. Uh, so 2009, uh, interned at Apple. First internship at Apple, uh, came back out here to California, super geeked, super juiced. Um, I was on the Pro Apps User Pubs team. So basically doing the web documentation for Final Cut Pro, uh, Logic Pro, you guys know those those applications, mm -hmm. um, yeah. So um, and that was cool because I'm I'm a music head and um, you know I got to kind of get in that realm and that team and see what they do. Uh, and once again, not using what I learned in school, uh, but that web programming experience that I learned at Microsoft and at Yahoo carried over here. So I was doing uh, this was my first introduction or my second introduction to web programming, um, and I was doing a lot of HTML and CSS and uh, cleaning up code. I was doing a lot of cleaning up code. And I'll talk about that later when I talk about design and code. Um, but uh, I handled and, and did a lot of uh, QA, which is what I do now. Um, uh, the code that ran the web documentation, which is on documentation.apple.com, uh, for those products. And um, it was awesome. It, it, was, it was a great experience. I came back uh, to Apple, which I'll, I'll say, um, in the next slide, but um, funny experience uh, with Steve. Um, so I actually met him on an elevator, and uh, when you work at Apple, like they tell you, uh, if you see Steve Jobs, don't say anything to him because he's gonna kill you, and blah blah blah. You know, they just really indoctrinate fear, like you know, because you know Steve in, in his history, you know, he's known to be like militant, no nonsense, no BS kind of guy. Uh, so I'm walking into uh, the building that I worked in, the second internship, which is the main building, it was IL-1, um, and on the fourth floor, which is the executive floor. So my team was on that floor. And um, 
I'm walking in the building from lunch, I'm on the phone, I'm talking to whoever, one of my friends, and then I see Steve Jobs and Johnny Ive, you guys know Johnny Ive, uh, so they're walking in, and I see them walking behind me, like approaching the elevator, so I'm like, oh shoot, let me call you back, let me call you back. Hang up the phone, walk in the elevator, uh, and I'm kind of trying to slow my walk up because I kind of want them to catch me on the elevator so I can be in that position, uh, you know, not knowing what I'm getting into again. Uh, but as I walk on, another person walks on and he holds the elevator for them. So I was just, it was bound to happen. So I get on the elevator and I'm sitting there and they're talking. So I'm like, wow, like, they're standing right there. This is, <laughs> this, is, this is power in one elevator. Uh, so they're talking, so I don't want to interrupt them. Uh, so they're talking, they're talking, uh, the guy that was on gets off and it's just us three and they're, they're going to my floor. So we get to the fourth floor, I'm sitting there and then we get there, door opens and I'm just like, <laughs> and I walk out, I don't say, I, I totally freezed up, uh, uh, froze up rather. And, um, y you know, uh, but he was nice. He was a nice guy. I think in those later years, 2009, 2010, when he was going through the health stuff, um, this is just my personal kind of view. I, I felt like he was more in tune with the employees and just kind of opened up, you know. Um, you know, when you would see him in the courtyard and in the quad and at lunch, you know, he'd look at you, smile, he acknowledge you. Um, totally different than the fear that they indoctrinate <laughs> within you. Um, he was a, a, a super, of course, a brilliant guy. Um, I recommend his, uh, his biography um, uh, that you guys, uh, if, I don't know if you guys have read it or, or, or heard about it, but yeah, yeah, you, you guys should definitely um, check that out. What did you say? It's Joe on Netflix now. Oh yeah, yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Um, but yeah, great guy, great guy, as you know. And uh, yeah, that's me, uh, you know, doing my thing. Um, Could have went to the NBA, but I said, nah, I'm just gonna focus on my tech career. Uh, but this is, uh, this is at Apple. Uh, this is during my second internship. Uh, Got, they had a basketball court on campus, and um, you know we would play after work. You know, um, every Tuesday and Thursday, uh, and they were shooting this for um, some of their like recruiting materials they wanted to roll out. They were doing like a new kind of thing for the website and brochures that they would go to college campuses. So, got to be immortalized, which was cool. Um, that second summer, I interned on the Logic Pro and GarageBand team. Uh, so that was awesome, and that was my first um, introduction to uh, QA, doing uh, quality assurance and testing. And uh, it was cool because I'm a music head, I'm a producer and writer, so to be testing and, and, and um, working with the engineers that work on the software that I use for my art was awesome. And um, it, it was really, really cool. Um, another obstacle though, the end of that summer, they said they didn't have headcount to hire me full time. So, end of that summer, I'm emailing teams, I'm emailing managers in the company like, yo, I've interned here, I've interned there, I know this, I know that, can you help me out? Uh, finally got connected um, with the iOS manager uh, and, and Apple, the iOS QA manager, and uh, he hired me on full time after that summer, and that's how I got my start full time at Apple. <clears throat> and I started at Apple in 2011, and I was there for two years. Uh, so y'all remember this guy, Toy Story, uh, Sid, I remember Sid? Yeah, so um, this is how I kind of, um, uh, my idea of QA uh, was initially. I mean, you know, you get the product, you know, oops, sorry. Uh, you get the product, you know, from design and, and uh, you know, the programmers and the coders, and then you just, you just blow it up. You just go crazy on it, you test it, you break it. Um, and I was attracted to that because in all of my coding experience in school, um, you know, it was just so difficult for me to grasp. And you know, when you're in school, you're doing like projects that are kind of mundane. You're not really doing like what you would really do in the real world. You're learning principles, uh, but you're not doing anything like super like mind blowing. Uh, so it was hard for me to grasp, and QA was, was uh, attractive to me because, um, you know, I had that background. I could speak the language that the developers were speaking, but I didn't have to write the code. You know, I could approach things from a user experience uh, standpoint as well. So in doing QA, I've, 
you know, kind of consider myself a uh, user experience kind of guy and, and, you know, wanting to approach things and for the benefit of the user, even product experience, you know, and just product direction and vision, you know, you get the product and then you can analyze it from all these different angles. You're talking with designers, you're talking with developers, you're talking with product managers, you're talking with people from localization, and you know, they're all approaching it from their specialties, and then you're approaching it from all of their specialties, and then the user. So um, I think of QA as a great hub of um, positions to kind of be in technically, where you can exercise your technical prowess, you can exercise your user empathy, um, and it's cool, you know, and you're not just you know, kicking stuff off and breaking it, you're also providing solutions and um, remedies. So um, that's how I got my start in QA at Apple and iOS. Poster child of the company, which is awesome. And uh, it was a great two years there. Uh, oh man, the transition didn't work. Uh, I was gonna say I made this quote up and then uh, stick to you, Jive's name on it, but uh, I guess you guys, uh, no, now. Anyway, uh, yeah, so, you know, Steve Jobs, Apple, you guys looking at Max right now, um, you know Apple to be the design kings, right? Like, they just, they get it right. You know, they, they say, you know, the stuff just works. That's their motto. It just works. Um, and, you know, when I was there, uh, you know, working in iOS, like the poster child of the company, um, I'm looking at the design of everything, and uh, sometimes I'm in awe, but sometimes I'm like, like, what are we doing? We're supposed to be like, you know, the kings of kings, you know, in design. And, and I'm like, I don't agree with any of this stuff we're doing. Uh, sometimes, sometimes. Uh, but it, the whole of Apple is they approach design in a way where, you know, it's easy, it's simple, like if things just work, you don't have to think about it. If you have to think about it or ask questions, like they didn't get it right, right? That's their whole thing. Um, and oh, just a disclaimer, I'm not speaking for Apple or Twitter, you know, just, you know, uh, this is my, my thoughts, my views are my own. Uh, but this quote, you know, design is not just what it looks and feels like, design is how it works. Um, and I think Steve is right in, in that, um, you know, it's not just the aesthetic, it's not just the, the gradient. It's not just, you know, the bells and whistles, but um, it speaks to even, you know, developers and code. Um, and I'll talk about this a little more later and talk about like, you know, how um, I think you all, as, as graphic design students, um, you know, should get a little bit into code and, and to, you know, um, develop that skill, not necessarily to be, um, a super crazy developer, but just to be able to empathize more with people in tech. Um, and if you're going to design in tech, you know, that you have that background and that footing um, to be able to, you know, talk to people and move around and make yourself more marketable as well. Uh, so you know that you're not just like creating something, you know, and, and being selfish because I, I think design is, is not about you. You know, design is about your customer and, and the, the story you're trying to tell and the problem you're trying to solve. Um, so th this quote resonated with me and I think um, it's relevant to what you guys are doing as well. Uh, so at Apple, um, you guys know about the, the idea of, of skeuomorphism, right? Uh, no, do you? No. Okay, okay, okay. Cool. I was just cool. looking that up. Okay. But I, don't, I didn't really get it. I didn't have time. It was like this morning before I came here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Safe to say, people maybe heard the term before, maybe not, or maybe don't know what it is. All right, so between iOS, uh, or before iOS 7, um, all of iOS um, had the theme of these skeuomorphic designs. Uh, and skeuomorphism is basically when, uh, and don't quote me, you guys can, can Google it to get the finer uh, definition, but it's when design mimics or is a replica of uh, the realistic function of what you're trying to uh, create. So this is uh, the Contacts app on iPad. Um, and as you can see, it looks like what? An address book, right? Uh, but it's on a tablet. And this actually doesn't work like a real address book, right? You know, it doesn't, doesn't turn, doesn't, you know, do that. So you know, you think like, okay, that's cute, but 
why mimic an address book on a tablet, you know, um, when, you know, I guess that, that connects you with the idea of what it is, but there's no real need for you to create this or design this like that, you know, to make this, you know, this leather stitching and that whole nine kind of thing. But it was the way that Apple was doing things for a while. And you think like these design kings, and this is, you know, we're in, we're in 21st century, 2010, 2011, 2012, and still doing things like this. You know, this is the, before iOS 7, you know, they were going this route and it's just kind of like, you know, it wasn't needed because um, one thing I'll talk about in the next example is, you know, if you do things in a skeuomorphic way, you know, you also bring the limitations of the real world thing you're trying to rep, you know, replicate. Um, and I'll show that in the, in the next example with the calendar app. Uh, so a skeuomorphic design, this is a calendar app on iPad, right? And uh, this looks just like a real calendar. So it's, it's cool, it's like, yeah, okay, I, I get exactly what this is, I know how to use it. Um, and this does actually work like a real calendar. I can pinch my finger here, swipe, and then you know you get the nice little ridges at the top uh, to make it kind of replicate, you know, oh, I'm tearing pages, oh, that's cool, oh, uh, you know. But, uh, so you look at this and you say, what's the limitation? Um, I can only view one month at a time. Uh, but I'm on a tablet, I'm on a touchscreen device, it's 2050 AD, why do I need to be limited to viewing this, you know, as one page at a time? You know, why? Why, why do I need that? You know what I mean? Um, it, it's just kind of like, uh, this is an example of, of the limitation uh, in design. So I guess it's cute and it helps you understand. I'm sure there were a lot of different reasons why they went this direction. Uh, but um, I, I think about this pivotal movement for Apple and then in design, and what you guys will get into, um, you think about the story you're trying to tell, the problem you're trying to solve, and then also the platform or the, the medium that you're designing in. Uh, and you think, okay, hey, I'm on a tablet. Uh, you know, how can I take advantage of this whole iOS ecosystem and what I'm designing? You know, uh, how are you know, five and six-year-olds going to use this calendar app? Or are they going to use it at all? If they are, what can they do with it? You know, um, I guess they may connect the, the thing that they see on the wall, but, you know, when they get older, why should they be limited by this, this view of a calendar app, you know, on this kind of a device, if that makes sense. Does that make any sense to you guys? Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, this was, a, this was a, um, an example of examples I, um, uh, I wanted to bring up because, uh, you know, it just kind of speaks to, um, solving problems in design and thinking about things holistically, you know, um, and kind of thinking ahead and thinking about a lot of different things, not just the aesthetic, but also how it works and how it will work uh, in the future. So I'm at Twitter now. Uh, like Sean said, uh, I've been doing a QA engineering and, and testing, software testing for the iOS and the Android app uh, for the past year. Uh, but now, uh, I'm doing um, release engineering for iOS. So I basically shepherd the release on iOS from start to finish. You guys use Twitter? Anybody, anybody use Twitter? Okay, iPhone, Android. Um, so on iOS, like I'm like at the beginning of the release, like we're doing the planning, we're talking about the features that are going in, working with developers and the product managers, and then um, shepherding them and helping them, making sure they're committing their code in the right places, uh, triaging the bugs that are coming in um, to the finish line, actually submitting the app to the app store. Like that's what I'm doing now. Um, so I bring up this, this design or these mocks um, and, and I'm talking about design um, and you think about what Twitter is, um, you know, what's the best way to represent something that's real time or real time information. Um, and I would say in a continuous stream, right? So uh, we know Twitter to be that on mobile devices, a continuous stream of information. You keep scrolling, you keep scrolling, you pull the refresh, you get you know, information, keep pop, keeps piping in the timeline. Uh, but in iOS and Android, look at the design of how this is done uh, and you think about, okay, well, 
why doesn't Android have tabs like iOS? You know, um, why not? I mean, they're doing the same thing, right? It's the same app, they're trying to achieve the same purpose. Like, why do they have different mocks on different platforms? Um, and, and one thing, the answer is, uh, well, they, Android used to have tabs, but when Android moved to, um, uh, I guess, I, it's called a design, maybe ecosystem, uh, called Pure Android, um, which is basically kind of having the native apps have this transition of swiping, um, and you can swipe on Android now, you get to these different screens, you can also tap, but um, that gesturing, introducing that move, um, we wanted to take advantage of that. Um, so it now becomes not what does my app do, uh, so I'm going to design it in the way my app works, or not solely that, but also what platform and what medium am I you know, designing for, and then how can users, let's say you're using, I don't know, Google Search or Google Plus, and they're using this, this gesture, and I do a quick switch in app in Twitter, how can I make it seem like they're not jumping into a whole different world? You know what I mean? If they're using that, that gesture, that pure Android design and the ecosystem, why not take advantage of that? So it's a purely selfish kind of thing, or selfless, sorry. It's <laughs> selfless kind of thing, you know, because as designers, as you guys get better and you get, you know, super dope at creating mocks and all this stuff, uh, you can't get caught up in, I'm just gonna create the biggest, best, like crazy, futuristic, year 3000 mock is gonna kill the game, blah, blah, blah. You know, you get caught up in, in that skill and the beauty, but you lose sight of who you're designing for and you lose sight of the customer and you lose sight of the story you're trying to tell. You lose sight of the, the frictionless experience that you want your customer to have. Um, so you're always thinking about, and I'm not a designer, but I work with a lot of them. You're always thinking about uh, the customer and how to make things easier for them. Um, and a, a lot of different ways that I've interacted with designers as a QA engineer, especially at Twitter because we're smaller, um, I often sit in uh, design reviews and look at mocks uh, before they uh, manifest in, on the device. So, um, and I'm not necessarily telling them what to do because I'm not the design expert, but I get to give little nuggets and I say, okay, well, I'm thinking about this. Okay, now I tap this a hundred times. You know, my finger's gonna get tired if this button is here. Or I can say, well, you know, maybe you wanna think about this because last time we did this like that and it didn't work out, stuff like that. You know, I'm not, you know, ripping apart mocks because I'm not the VP of design, but you know, in QA, you get to give that insight, especially if you're testing and you're trying to be that voice of the user. They have another, um, I guess, uh, audience or another uh, vantage point to look at and to get critique, you know, from my view. Um, and I'm taking into account, uh, you know, how this is working from the tech side, from the engineers. I'm taking in how this is working, um, you know, from the product side and what they want. And I'm looking at it and how design, you know, tell, tells their story. And, you know, you want to let designers um, be free to, uh, you know, tell their story because they're also thinking about the customer as well. So it's not like, everybody's in la la land and I'm the only one like hey guys we gotta get serious you know um, we're all trying to achieve the same goal um, but like I said before in QA I've been uh, at the hub of everyone's kind of view so it's easier for me to have a bird's eye view and say okay just think about this just think about that you know what about this or you know when you swipe this way you know you get a glitch or you swipe that way and blah blah blah, blah. Um, so um, I, I wanted to just kind of show this to say you know we're the same the same app, same purpose, but you're on different platforms, you want to do different things to take advantage of uh, the, the ecosystem that you're um, developing around or designing for. Uh, so th I came across this quote, um, I, I was, I was uh, this is not by a famous person, it's something I just kind of found on the web. Um, and uh, it says it's easier to work design around code than it is to work code around design. Um, I don't know, I'm not saying that I endorse it. I think there's some truth to it. Um, I don't know if I, uh, 
would put that as a bumper sticker on my car. Uh, but, you know, um, and, and this arose from uh, a discussion, a heated debate on why designers, uh, web designers in, in particular at the time, didn't know basic HTML or CSS. Um, and, um, and then this also uh, kind of arose from the rebuttal of, well, what about developers? Like, why don't developers, you know, pick up design skills? Why don't they know how to use Photoshop? Why don't they know how to use CS4 and all these different tools? Um, and this was the quote. So, you know, it's easier to work design around code than it is to work code around design. And I think about that um, and you think about what code is doing. Um, and there's design and code. I'll get into that later. But um, the, the code is, is purely functional at the functional level, you know? Um, so as long as my engine is running, I can put the outer layer of the shell on the car on top of that and, you know, just make sure, you know, the engine is, is pumping out the right fluids and going to the right places and just, you know, you're putting a wrapper around that. Uh, versus, um, you know, a lot of times, and I've seen in my experiences, maybe design to get too out there um, and then designer has, I guess, no kind of um, perspective on what's possible to implement, you know, and then you get that disconnect of, you know, hey, this is my design, this is my baby, this is what I'm clutching to, uh, but you lose sight of, you know, your other customer who is the developer, not necessarily the end user, but, you know, your customer is the developer, so they have to look at it and say, okay, do this, okay, okay. Cool. And I actually, I talk to the developers on my team a lot, and I'm like, because I look at the designs that Twitter does and our mocks and some of the stuff we have is like so beautiful. And I'm like, man, how do you, when you look at that, do you, are you instantly intimidated? And, you know, seasoned developers, they can kind of look at something and they know like what's, what's possible and what's, what's not possible to implement. Uh, and the designers too. I think a lot of designers um, that I work with and that I've seen, they at least have basic HTML, CSS, uh, skills so they just know and they can empathize with the developer more. So it's not necessarily about a war between designers and coders, um, but designers, I think, um, just from a pure, purely like marketing standpoint and yourself and skills, uh, you want to have that, uh, that prowess because, um, you know, you don't want to just be, you know, a guy that can just make posters. You know, you want a guy, you want to be the guy that says, you know, oh, and I have the prototype ready for you to see. You know, like, I'm not just stuck, like, okay, like, now I got to find somebody to do it. You know, you're also the guy that's getting out the door. So I'm not saying that, you know, I think in, in, in your perspective, you know, you have to, like, pick up, you know, HTML or CSS and be the man and be the master at it. But um, I, I think it is, uh, this quote rings true a bit. And um, it is definitely a, uh, a skill to want to pick up so you're not paralyzed and not boxed in. Uh, but also be very, very good at design. You know, you don't want to, uh, you know, just be a third or half good at a bunch of stuff. You know, you at least want to be super, super good at one thing at least, you know. Um, so at least the, design, the developers can come to you and they say, no, it's fine. Like, I know you're a man at design. I know you're a woman. I'm sorry. I don't mean to be sexist or anything like that. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, they know your expertise and they can empathize with you as well. So uh, this quote rings, rings true in a lot of different areas. Uh, so this is just a screenshot of what I was doing in my first internship at Apple. Um, and, and believe it or not, uh, these two blocks of code, this is CSS, they do the exact same thing. Uh, so I was presented with a lot of different um, CSS files and, and my manager was like, okay, this stuff is getting too complex. Like we gotta, we gotta get this stuff to be at least readable. Um, so I'm coming from the developer standpoint and you look at the before and the before was done by, <laughs> believe it or not, a designer that had some, some coding experience. Uh, and after is what I had to kind of dig through and figure out what was going on and, and say, okay, like this is doing the exact same thing. Um, and I don't know if this looks foreign to you guys, but uh, 
this is basically the OL and the LI and all that kind of stuff is just um, like list selectors and elements. And it's basically just trying to define um, in a web document, um, okay, if I'm in a ordered list and then I go to a bulleted list and then that list is indented some more and then this is here, then put these properties in it, put this color weight on it, put this font in it. That's basically just what it's saying. Um, and it got to be so complex and so redundant uh, that um, we assigned complexity values to the selectors themselves and we had to measure, um, that was our way of measuring just how complex it was from a, a metric standpoint. Um, so I had to dig in and do a little troubleshooting in QA and say, okay, if I take this out, does it look the same? No, it's not, okay, put that back. Um, and try to understand just what was going on. Uh, but it, for designers and, and learning code, um, you know, I would imagine that this designer maybe, you know, just picked up the basics and then just tried to implement it. Um, but in code, like a coder doesn't know everything about design. I'm sure a designer doesn't know everything about code unless you master both. Um, you know, they're just trying to get the job done. They're just trying to make it look good. They're not thinking about um, optimizing efficiency. They're not thinking about if this page loads, you know, how long it takes to load, you know. Um, and then, you know, they're thinking about, I guess, themselves in this, reset, um, this respect, sorry. Um, but not thinking about those things where if I load this page, you know, over a number of times, you know, how many milliseconds is that like stacking on to my browsing experience as a user um, if I'm just doing this redundant kind of definition over and over and over and over again. Um, and then after a while, we found that, you know, after reducing a lot of this stuff, um, things like, you know, low times and efficiency improved um, from eliminating a lot of that redundancy and, um, you know, we, um, we got that down, fixed it up, um, and uh, it was a great thing, but I came from the development background, so I kind of knew about that kind of stuff, and I was thinking about efficiency and, you know, timing, uh, but the designer wasn't. Um, but that's not a, a, a rip on designers. It's just um, kind of speaks to the limitations in that aspect, too. So, you know, um, I, I think from a designer standpoint, if you learn the basics and you learn how to code, you can at least speak the language, you can empathize with developers and what they're doing. Um, but, you know, I wouldn't necessarily suggest, you know, coding up a whole uh, site, especially one that has to scale to millions and millions of users uh, if you're not thinking about other things like efficiency and stuff like that. Um, so that, that was a good experience for me uh, and coming from the developer background and seeing how designers um, express themselves through code and then also um, having to do a sort of code cleanup and a um, optimization kind of exercise. Uh, so, so that was a good experience. Does that make any sense? Yeah, cool, cool. Um, and I have a quick question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you think, uh, uh, as an engineer, could, what do you think about use uh, as an alternative? You said um, news? News. I do it. I do it news. Muse. Oh, the software. Yeah, exactly. Oh, okay. I actually, I'm not familiar with Muse. Okay. I'm not familiar with Muse. Uh, is that? Is it? Is it? It's on par with like. So okay. So wait. There's Photoshop, right? So, Where? So Where's Muse? Dreamweaver Muse basically is it's a platform for you to go ahead and actually create your website. Ah, okay. So coding in the background as we go ahead and put pieces in the web or something like that. Okay, 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 got you. So like so like kinda like a coding for dummies for designers, so to speak. The, the interface is similar to InDesign. Okay. Where you're actually designing out and then it generates code for you. Mm, okay. Yeah. So it's almost like reverse engineering with yep. Dreamweaver. Yeah. Actually doing the opposite. Right, 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 right. right. Microsoft has a tool like that too, as well. It's like a plug and play, almost like Scratch. Yeah, right? yeah. Like yeah. No, it's awesome. Uh, I, I think tools like that are awesome. Um, I, I'm not familiar with Muse, but I think those templates are awesome. Uh, definitely, it saves time. Just a quick question. You know, yep. um, I, do you know Andre from Twitter? He was, he was Andre. Twitter. Andre. He worked in Adobe too, but the point okay. is, is that he was saying that 
not to worry about the new software and the latest software, mm -hmm. but to be very good at one specific software. Yeah, yeah. Not get caught up with the latest thing out. Yeah. Do you have any perspective on that? Absolutely. Um, so, well, I, I, I'll speak to that and I'll speak to that too. I kind of maybe combine them. Um, I think those tools are great, uh, especially saves time for you um, because, you know, if you're at the point where, you know, you have a mock and you have the design, either you have it in your head or you have it out on paper or whatever, um, you don't necessarily want to crack open a book to look at how to do this stuff. You know, whatever makes your life easier. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm for that. You know, take advantage of these tools. Like, they're, they're there, like, use them. Like, I'm not, I'm not like, oh, well, you got to, you know, earn your stripes and pay your dues and, you know, Go learn, you know, no, like, I mean, we're information age, take advantage of it. I think it is also beneficial while you're plugging the pieces together to look at if they reveal the code, like to actually look at it and see, you know, um, you know, how it's kind of implementing or what they're doing to implement it. Um, I think that's awesome. Uh, but I think th those tools are awesome. If you can use them to your advantage, uh, if they're not limiting you, like, why not? You know, um, I think that's awesome. Uh, and I actually, I'll actually talk to some designers too. Um, I know like, I mean, we use Photoshop and all the other Adobe Suite stuff. Um, I'm not proficient with Photoshop at all. Actually, it's crazy. I think I should because, I mean, it's 2014. Uh, but, you know what I'm saying? But like, who doesn't know how to use Photoshop uh, but me? Uh, so, um, but no, I think those tools are, are awesome. I think they're awesome too. Um, with getting caught up in, I guess, trends or the, the fads or whatever, I think there's a happy medium. I think you definitely don't want to be left behind, um, but you also, uh, you know, you want to get comfortable and, and master what you're doing. It's what works for you. You know, you don't want to necessarily, you know, you go to a conference and they're like, oh, use the 2015 Ferrari F1000, whatever. Um, this is the way, this is what the cool kids are using, and you feel like, man, I gotta throw away everything I learned and use this. Um, now, take it with a grain of salt. Like, I mean, if it's Johnny Ive saying that from Apple, then you may wanna be like, all right, let me dip my foot in this. But, um, y you know, you, you don't wanna be left behind, uh, you know, but you also don't wanna get caught up in the wave. Like, learn, like, use what works for you. Um, and then that, and then that's if you're like an individual, um, a uh, designer or like a freelance or contractor or whatever. But if, of course, it's different if you're working at a, a corporate company, you want to use what the company's using. You don't want to, everybody using, you know, Adobe Suite stuff and you're using, you know, I don't know, whatever, uh, paint, Microsoft Paint, you know, because <laughs> that's like, that's my thing. I'm com most comfortable with paint. Like, it's <laughs> like, uh, okay there, buddy. How did you get hired here? Uh, you know, uh, so you, you definitely want to take that into account, but, um, to speak to you know Sean's question, I agree. Like you know, don't you don't have to get caught in the wave of um, the latest trends and fads. Cause it's easy to do that too. You're in Silicon Valley. Like this place is just like, man, they could just get taxing on. Like, oh, this is the future. No, 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 really, this is the future. Like I mean, it's just like, oh my God. Like, goodness gracious. You know, you can really get caught up in that that whirlwind of, uh, of preachers and evangelists. Um, but you know, you wanna get comfortable and, and master, um, get a pulse of what the industry is using. Um, I think that's also uh, important too. Um, you know, if you're going, you wanna be a designer at a tech company, uh, you wanna talk to designers from tech companies to see what tools they're using. And then you get on that boat um, and not say, I'm not gonna do that, I'm gonna do my own thing. And then they're gonna hire me. You know, it's like, well, that's where you want to go and you're not familiar with that, how is that going to happen? Um, so it's a lot of different things. You don't want to get caught up. You want to get a pulse of what people are using and um, you want to use what's, what works best for you. And also, you know, there's different tools, you know, do different things. So um, you also want to, if you want to do something that's rich in flash, of course you want to use X tool. If you want to do something that's purely HTML5, you may want to use other tools. So. Um, know what works best for you and what tools do the right things. So yeah, it's also about what tools bring out the best um, product for whatever they're, they're good at doing also, if that made any sense. Hope that was clear. Um,
so yeah I, right now I, I got a little bit of time left but I just want to open it up to um, a little more um, informal conversation if you guys have any questions about my experiences design uh, code life Detroit basketball Justin, you oh, thank you thank you Thank you. Thank you.